From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. You can find corruption and conspiracy in the oddest places. Longtime listeners, you're well aware of this. Uh, and today we are traveling up to the land of our lovely northern neighbors. We're traveling to Canada through the power, the mind, right? The theater of imagination. And in this episode, we're exploring a bizarre international, well, you could call it a conspiracy. You could call it an industry. Uh, some people rightly or wrongly are convinced it is a scam or even racketeering. Uh, in, in this is a story that may well travel all the way up to your own breakfast table. No kidding. Before we do the big reveal and get into this, I have one very important question for you, Noel, and for you, Matt, and for everyone listening along at home. Waffles or pancakes? If you had to choose one. Ooh. You know, I like a waffle because of the little divots. They just hold the syrup so nicely. They're like little syrup cups. You know, I would have said waffle. But the other day, I had pecan pancakes, or pecan pancakes, mm -hmm. if you're nasty, and they were incredible, <laughs> and I used this very bottle of 100%, allegedly, maple syrup, and it was delicious. Ah, oh, yes. You were just showing the side, Matt. I, I didn't see the front. I, won't, uh, won't I didn't want to show you the actual company we can, we, we can that it's it. from we can blur it in post <laughs> yeah okay well it checks out you can see Got you it. can see the the name here the yeah i myself am a waffle person because of the surface area conundrum that you mentioned earlier no or it's a feature not a bug uh also because of the ingredients but the the crux of today's story fellow conspiracy realist is maple syrup Yes, you are listening to a show about critical thinking applied to conspiracy theories. And yes, this episode is about maple syrup. Trust us, worth it. Promise. Yeah. Uh, so here are the facts. If you're like most people, you've heard of maple syrup, right? You've heard of it. It's not, it's not new to your human experience. It's made from this substance called xylem sap, and it comes primarily from three types of trees that are all maples. Uh, the the big the big dog in the game is sugar maple, but you'll also see people uh, ultimately creating maple syrup from red and black maple trees. It's not a new idea. Like a lot of things on this continent, indigenous people had learned the trick of of this thousands and thousands of years ago. They already knew how to take this slightly sweet sap and turn it into syrup and the process that these earlier people discovered or created continues today. It's a really neat marriage of art and science. And it's something that I think a lot of people don't think about. Like when, if you live in many parts of the U S uh, you may not even find real maple syrup that often you may go for the much more affordable table syrup, uh, which is not, not the legit maple syrup, but if you're in certain regions of this continent, particularly the eastern, northeastern seaboard, right, Canada uh, and New England, then it would be tremendously insulting to serve table syrup to your loved ones or your friends. They would think, oh, okay, Mr. Cheap Stuff over here has decided that we are acquaintances and not... Yeah. Yeah. And and like it, it can seriously be seen as an insult. And that's because they are very different things. The I, I think to set this up, we need to talk a little bit about the process of creating this stuff. 
uh, because so much work goes into it. And when you understand how much work goes into it, you can understand uh, a little bit of why maple syrup is such a big deal to some people. So let's talk about sap. That's what we're going to talk about, because uh, you need a lot of it to make maple syrup. Uh, the sap is almost like uh, water uh, in terms of the makeup of the product. Uh, it is an incredibly thin um, substance that contains about 2% sucrose, so it makes it sweet, and about 30 to 40 gallons of sap is what it takes to make just a single gallon of maple syrup. Um, and while, of course, the sap is the key ingredient in the process, um, it also uh, requires another key ingredient, which is time. Um, you have to have, you know, t t you can't grow a tree overnight. A tree needs to be healthy, and it needs to be at least around 10 inches in diameter before it can be tapped, um, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you you know, stick a device into the tree that then sucks out the sap, or at least allows you to drain the tree of that sap. Um, and it typically takes a tree around 40 years to reach that kind of size. Yeah, and it's pretty amazing. The process really is amazing if you watch some videos online about it and seeing, especially if it's a larger operation with a lot of maple trees that have been tapped and just watch, looking at the lines of, of sap that just, you know, slowly drain from the tree into a collection area. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, this is, it's... Uh it's fascinating because you could you could tap a younger or smaller tree but it would have it, it, it would have um tough effects on the health of the tree which is super important that's why we say it takes about 40 years because you're waiting for it to reach that size and for a large tree if it's large enough you could have multiple taps on the tree there's a lot of really cool terminology here that I've just sort of unapologetically peppered through because it's it's a lot to take in all at once but think of it this way so the people who tap these trees they are called sugar makers which i think is uh tremendously sweet on several levels and they they're part of where the art and the science really meet to do this successfully, they need to have a very deep understanding of each tree. Like they tend to know its history. They know if it had any like problems with bugs or some kind of, you know, um, rot got to it. And they take r immense, immense pains not to do any lasting harm because if everything goes well, these trees can be tapped again and again, multiple times over a long period of time, like a century or more. And and Matt, I'd love to uh, hear a little more about that sap collection process because it, uh, it changed over time, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, before the invention of, I guess, modern plastics and, uh, you know, just some innovation, the way you would tap an old maple back in the day is you would have you would do the thing you have to get a hole into the tree itself but before it was just this kind of wooden like a wooden tube let's say mm -hmm. that would come out like a spout almost or uh, that just kind of goes down and is angled down and then you'd hang a bucket onto that wooden piece or at least you'd get a bucket very close to where that wooden piece is it's actually tapping the tree that bucket would fill up and then you'd take the bucket over dump it into wherever you collect and then put like it back a big, sometimes like a big pan yeah, and exactly. You would, you would boil mm -hmm. you you boil the sap down. You're reducing it to something something thicker. But plastic changed this operation, made it much more efficient. You know, it's funny. It almost reminds me of those old, uh, I believe, Tropicana orange juice ads, where it was just like a straw shoved into the orange. The implication being that it's like it comes, you know, it's the freshest you can get without sucking it straight from the orange. But it's about that low tech, even in the modern day. I mean, you're literally shoving a thing into the tree that is then pulling this, draining the sap out into some receptacle. Oh. But yeah, and Ben made a really, really great point just before we got into the, the tubing and everything. Just that if you mess up and you tap the tree wrong or in the wrong place or too many times and you lose that, imagine you're losing 40 years minimum of effort to get that tree to where it needs to be to even be tappable. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's why like, that's why it is such, there's so much of an art to it um, mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and a science to make yeah, it work. Yeah, 
That sweetie was song is actually about tapping in. <laughs> I was going to ask Ben, is it because it replenishes itself over time? Like, do you have to give, like, leave a period, you know, of kind of rest in between tapping so that the sap can be replenished? Or is it a yeah. finite amount? I would imagine it's the former. Yeah, yeah, uh, you're correct. It's the it's the former. There is a finite amount of sap, but to be clear, uh, no sugar maker is uh, parasitic or, or vampiric here. They're not draining these trees dry. It's almost like, for a very crude analogy, it's almost like they're giving blood. Like yeah. the process of donating blood is meant to leave the donor healthy. So, like a really responsible vampire. <laughs> like a very, like a ethical, like the kind of vampire that shops at the vampire equivalent of a co-op or Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. uh, co-op, Whole Foods is no longer the best example. But <laughs> but uh, part of the way they do this and keep these healthy is also by limiting the um, the amount of time per year when this when this tapping occurs. It only takes place for about four to six weeks. So think roughly a month and change during something that is called adorably the sugar season, which I think is also a good name for maybe not a band, but an album. And this is still like, we'll see there's a lot of limitation here and the limitations placed on this process. People would argue for the good of the tree, uh, but they're also at the whim of the weather. It's there. There's a ideal time to, uh, tap this tree, tap into this tree. And most of these tap holes only give you about 10 gallons of sap throughout that period. So for, so thinking back to, um, you know, the attrition that you had described, Noel, that means that we're talking four tap holes over a period of uh, around four to six weeks, making 40 gallons of sap, making one gallon of maple syrup a ton Whoa. of work goes into this yeah a ton of work and not that much yield right and right. and therein lies this entire episode mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah it's a fascinating process and we could spend some time you, you know especially um for those of you all familiar with our old school origins uh, how stuff works we would totally spend an hour talking, just exploring how cool this process is. But for our purposes today, fellow conspiracy realists, it's just important to know how much work goes into each one of those little bottles. The industry today is surprisingly big. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of money in maple. It turns out uh, by 2023, this is going to be worth the maple syrup industry alone is going to be worth $1.7 billion. This story may be familiar to some of us listening today because there was a Netflix documentary that came out not too long ago, a great series called Dirty Money. And in one episode in season one of Dirty Money, uh, they discuss uh, maple syrup in a way that's related to this. It turns out officially because of all the time dedicated to creating this uh, there is a premium in price, but it's also only part of the reason there's a premium of price. Anyway, right now, one of the statistics you'll hear thrown around is accurate, but it changes a little bit uh, year over year. A single barrel of maple syrup would be worth around $1,800, $1,800, which makes it currently more than 20 times the price of a barrel of oil, which is right now, as we record, about 73 to 74 bucks. Uh, and that'll that'll change, but there, maple syrup has been more expensive than oil for a long, long time. Yeah, it, yeah. And it's a really great comparison because Ben isn't joking or talking around it when he's saying a barrel of this substance, the, a barrel of oil is the same as a, they're the, the same barrels basically, um, that, that you can find maple in and, and oil in. And that also is very important to this story. Yeah. Yeah. 42 gallons. That's how much a uh, 42 U S gallons. That's, that's the size of both of these kinds of barrels. So this industry also gets further specialized because it's very localized. Maples don't grow everywhere. Maple syrup's not made everywhere. In fact, it's it's pretty much exclusively created in North America. The biggest U.S. manufacturer 
is Vermont. That stereotype is true. <laughs> Vermont is, is, is a very big uh, maple syrup industry, at least in the U.S. But that U.S. behemoth is absolutely dwarfed by Canada. That's where the real maple action goes down. The province of Quebec specifically makes in excess of 70% of the world's entire supply of maple syrup. And this is why outfits like The Economist uh, or investigative reporters like Carolyn Jarvis, who appears in Dirty Money, have called Canada the Saudi Arabia of maple syrup. It's not just a clever title. It's pretty accurate. It's all intermeshed with the oil industry. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and most people outside of these very specific regions um, that specialize in producing this stuff um, or outside specific industries uh, that are associated don't really think about maple syrup um, until back in 2012, that is, when there was a story that hit the press um, where it had been discovered that someone had pulled a heist, uh, Ben, uh, you, you referred to it as an Ocean's Eleven level heist with your bag man and your inside man and all your other, I mean, it doesn't have to be a man, but, you know, in the parlance of heists. And this crew, um, if you will, were involved in stealing thousands of tons um, of the stuff and making off with around $18.7 million Canadian which is around 15 million USD um, worth of maple syrup. And if you were talking about this around the water cooler, uh, it might have at the time, like it did for most people, I imagine, strike you as a little bit funny. Um, Immediately just, when you hear somebody stole maple syrup. That's right. Because yeah, what do again, you do with all of it? That's what, <laughs> what do you Matt do and with I were it? like back in 2012. That was the immediate question. It's like one of those heists where... You know, uh, I try not to say this too often on air, but oh, I have a weird thing with dirigibles. And I always joked about stealing a blimp or an airship. And the big, the reason that's so humorous is because the hell do you do with it? Where, where are you, you going to put it? With, yeah, where are you going to yeah. put all that maple syrup? How do you how do you explain that? How do you how do you launder maple syrup? How do you well, f uh, fence maple syrup? It's a good question, Ben. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, how is it any different than any other valuable uh, commodity? You know, because right. valuable it absolutely is, as you mentioned earlier. So, I mean, it's absolutely sticky brown gold is what this stuff is. But, um, you know, chuckles aside, when the story came through, there really is absolutely a dark, uh, presumably somewhat sticky underbelly to the world of maple syrup because the story didn't just end up exposing these criminals who did get caught and convicted ultimately it exposed something else something much deeper and arguably more sinister um, a multi-generational cartel-like operation that spanned decades yeah yeah you see the economist and jarvis didn't just say that canada was the saudi arabia of maple syrup they went a little further and they said this situation also has an OPEC. Ooh. Yeah. There's a conspiracy afoot in the land of pancakes and waffles, folks. Just like the stories of diamonds or the early days of light bulbs, turns out maple syrup is run by a cartel. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. <laughs> 